of you judge by appearance? Don't see. Yeah, of course we do. Let me just tell you a story. I, I don't know if you uh, if you're familiar with this term. Probably not. But there's a um, when we were in South Africa, there was a, a, a group of people called Abaqueta. And, and what they were is they were young men between like 17, 20, 22, in that range that went through the rite of circumcision. Uh, and among the Xhosa people, uh, that's the when you become a man, all right? So they would go and, and, and have this surgical procedure. And then while they were healing, it would take about 30 days. They would wander in rural areas and feed themselves with a spear, okay? Uh, they lived on the, and, and slept on the ground, and, uh, and you know, that's the way uh, it's always been done, right? So we're driving down the road. We got our kids in the car. We saw this huge turtle. We took a picture of it that went across the road. We had to stop for it. It was like a, a cow being in the road. It, was, well, it wasn't quite as big as a cow, but like a small cow, okay? So here it is. We're, we're driving there, and we pull over. We see these abaqueta in the field. And I'm saying to my wife, they're not going to come near us because they're, they're very, very reserved. Um, and, you know, they're all painted white. Um, and so uh, we get out, and I'm thinking, I'm going to take a picture, right? So they start coming over towards us. And I'm thinking, this is great. This is great. We're going to get the best pick ever, right? So I go, and I say, hello! Because, you know, people that don't speak English very well are also deaf. Right? Isn't that true? When you have somebody who speaks broken English, don't you speak louder? Sure you do. So I go, hello! Abaqueta! Like, they didn't know <laughs> what they were, right? And then I said, I, I'm thinking, I've got a few, i got some cosa here, so I'm going, andia funa u i foto! And I point at the camera. That's a, a visual. Point. E photo. Right? They look at each other. And I go, E photo. And the guy says, Line up, guys. He wants a pick. So I said to them, do you understand English? He says, yes, we're uh, university graduate students at the University of Fort Hare. And uh, we're taking a break from schooling to uh, fulfill this responsibility. Okay. Immediately, I didn't talk as loud, right? Because they actually weren't deaf, as it turned out. So what was I doing? I was, in ju I was judging entirely by appearance. In my mindset, if they were painted up like that and they were out in a rural area and carrying a spear, they couldn't speak English, they were a little bit dumb anyway, and they were deaf. Okay? So I had to use visuals and yell, all right? Uh, and it turned out uh, that they probably, they would certainly had more uh, uh, education maybe than I did at the time. So. I'm, I'm like, you know, realizing, and I've, and this happened to me a lot when I was overseas, and it's happened to me a lot in this country, where you make a judgment about somebody. Um, on the surface, it appears to be right, and it turns out to be completely wrong. Now, anybody else in here ever judge by appearance? Okay? I mean, how can we not judge by appearance? You, uh, uh, you see a man coming out of a bar with another man and they've got their arms around each other and they're stumbling down the street. What is it? Two drunks, right? Is it? Because that happened one time with my dad and it was one drunk, one sober guy helping a drunk go home. It was me helping my dad. But he was 6'4", so there was no way I was not, not going to stagger as I was walking down the street. So at first judgment, one of the members drove up the street, the church, and, and said, 
Oh, poor Kerry. He's gone into the, stepped in the, walked in the world. So they went to services the next morning, and they said, told the elders, and the elders, I walked in, and one of the elders goes, could you come in here? And I said, this is great, the elders want to talk to me. <laughs> yeah, not so much. Um, so what I'm telling you is that it's really easy, and you know what, I'm not blaming that lady for, for thinking that, because that's what it appeared to be. And, and imagine on that day when Zacchaeus, um, when Zacchaeus is trying to find out who it is. There's a lot in that little, in those ten verses. Zacchaeus doesn't know it's Jesus, because if he did, he wouldn't be trying to figure out who it was. But he knows who Jesus is, because his response is too much. There's nothing said to him, and he responds. He's ready to repent. So here's a man who has an honest, seeking heart, and he's looking, and he's heard about Jesus. And he wants to, to know Jesus. But on this day, he sees a crowd, and he's getting up in the tree to see who it is. And he's a tax collector. All right? When I look at this, I'm, we're going to read it again, and that's not because it wasn't read well. Jeff did a good job. But I think we, we learn by repetition. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He is gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So what do we learn about Zacchaeus? Okay, he's a chief of the publicans. Now, you have to understand, um, tax collectors, publicans, are not liked among the Jews. Kind of like today, all right? Uh, you know, you don't like, nobody likes to go down and hang out at the IRS, right? Only the IRS wasn't in a building that you went to or called or Googled the tax collector was there and usually had some force available to him to make sure you paid your taxes. And he didn't ha you didn't have charts and tables that told you what you were going to give. But the tax collector was pretty much allowed to extort as much as he wanted as long as he turned in the amount that the government wanted from him. All right? So you can just see... If you're an entrepreneur, you can see opportunity here, <laughs> right? Just Let's just say there were not any poor tax collectors. They were known for being wealthy. Okay, now Zacchaeus is not a tax collector. Zacchaeus is the chief of the tax collectors. Who is he extorting from? The tax collectors. They're extorting from the people. He's extorting from them. He's wealthy. It says, and he was wealthy. Really? <laughs> Not a big surprise. Okay? So we got this wealthy chief publican. I call him a district manager. He's a district manager, um, you know, maybe a regional supervisor. Nice names, aren't they? All right? Um, but tax collectors are outcasts. I mean, the Jews thanked God that they weren't tax collectors. Thank you, God, that I'm not a tax collector or a woman. Okay. Um, so <laughs> they, they did. They, they thanked God for those things. They were so pleased that they weren't, uh, that they weren't involved uh, with anything so unscrupulous as that. So you've got to imagine, um, even though he's wealthy, Zacchaeus isn't hanging out with a lot of people. And if he is... They're tax collectors. 
They're wealthy, unscrupulous people. That's who wants to be with a wealthy, unscrupulous person. So Jesus comes, and he goes and climbs up in a sycamore tree. Now, I had this picture this morning when I was going over this lesson. Because, you know, he's not going to be in sweats, right? He's wealthy. And, and everything about him is going to say tax collector, right? So here he is, this wealthy tax collector, up in a tree. You know, when we were kids, how we would have described that? <laughs> Something's wrong for this guy. Do you think they saw a lot of tax collectors up in the tree? Probably not. All right? So this, this is a guy that you walk on by. Really. You're Jesus, and you know Jesus. I'm not saying he, he avoided the rich, but he certainly... Um, appealed more to the common man. And so he's going to have a crowd of people. Oh, my wife says I should turn on the PowerPoint too. She did that without a word. Sorry about that. Huh. I'm so sorry. Okay. Now you can see what I was talking about. So now you know he was a tax collector and he was wealthy. And that nobody likes tax collectors. Okay? So when you think about that, you know, he's the kind of guy that Jesus would have, you would expect a great teacher of God's word to walk by. All right? Want anything to do with this? In fact, I might get tainted by this. The Pharisees would have walked by. You know they would have. So that's what surprises the people when Jesus doesn't. Jesus stops. But he doesn't just stop. He invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. Now that's happened to me before too. People have invited themselves to my house um, for supper. But uh, Jesus says, you know, you need to come down and you need to be quick about it because I'm going to your house today. And Zacchaeus is out of the tree in no time at all, right? And so all the people are saying, good for Zacchaeus, good for him, right? Good old Zacchaeus. No, they're grumbling and complaining. I mean, look at me. I am a good person. I am righteous. And, and he's going to go eat with this filthy tax collector? with all of his wealth. They're grumbling and complaining. Does anyone in here grumble or complain? Okay, just one. Right. The elders would like to meet with you afterwards, Fred. Of course we do sometimes, don't we? We like to grumble and complain. We like to, to criticize, too. Um, actually, you know, if I drag other people down low enough, I seem a little higher. <laughs> um, so uh, a lot of times that's the source of our criticism. So we're going to look at three observations. I'll try to be brief. The first one is that God sees people differently than we do. I don't think anyone will argue about that. The second one is that being a critic is the world's easiest job. I mean, if it paid well we would all be seeking that occupation uh, because uh, it, all com it comes pretty naturally to most of us. And then the third thing that I think kind of jumps out of this story is that it's easy to forget the reason Jesus actually came. And this story, more than most stories, points that out. So the first thing, God sees people differently than we do. See, all we talked about when we see the picture of Zacchaeus and what the people would see, his occupation. His occupation jumped right out. His wealth, and probably there's some people feeling kind of good because he may be wealthy and he may be a tax collector, uh, but he's a runt. 
He's a little guy. In fact, he's so little he has to climb a tree to see Jesus. If he's behind me, he's not seeing anything. Can't you just hear? How many of you have ever heard short jokes? Come on, Judy, I know you've heard them. Just kidding, just kidding. No. Tim said today, finally a lesson that relates to me. (laughs) No, I don't tell short jokes. Uh, But anyway, God sees people differently than we do. Here's what Jesus sees. He sees a man who's seeking, a man who's, who's eager, he's seeking. He's up in a tree trying to see Jesus. He's humble. I mean, Jesus, by all appearance, okay, is a carpenter's son. And this wealthy chief tax collector calls him Lord. He's a humble man. He's willing. I mean, there's nothing even mentioned about Jesus making any demands of him except he needs supper, okay? He's going to have to fix supper. Uh, And I'm pretty sure that Zacchaeus wouldn't be fixing it himself. And so, but Jesus isn't demanding anything, but immediately he tells Jesus what he's willing to do. Half of all of my wealth, I'm going to give the poor to the poor. And if I've defrauded, if I've defrauded, come on. If I've defrauded anyone, I'll give back fourfold to them. That's the kind of heart. When Jesus looks at Zacchaeus, that's who he sees. And then he sees a man who's lost. Because the whole thing ends with that Jesus came to seek and save he was lost. And that reference is to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was lost. And that's what Jesus saw. What did the people see? A wealthy tax collector that's short. He's corrupt. He's unscrupulous. I should not even... He doesn't deserve to even be in my presence. Certainly not in the presence of Jesus. And Jesus sees none of that. Jesus sees a seeking, humble, willing, lost soul that he can reach out to. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, and I know you all know this reference, um, the people wanted a king, and they were looking for somebody big, mighty, got to be good with a sword, and you got to ride a horse well. you got to look good on a horse. I mean, when they take those photos, e-photo, you gotta, you got to look good. You've got to look good sitting on that horse. Um, and the Lord says to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that was David. David, when God cho- chooses him as a young boy, he's of ruddy appearance. He's what we would call cute. Not what you're looking for in a king. Because when you're looking for a king, you're not looking for cute. You're looking for mighty, stately. You're looking for somebody that looks like he can lead this nation. That's not David. But God chose David because he looks at different things than we do. Isaiah 53, 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. That's speaking about Jesus, about the Messiah. What did people see when they saw Jesus? I didn't see the movie Son of God. Don saw it and gave me his critique of it. Um, I don't. I can't give you a number. We're thinking about doing a new movie critic thing where thumbs up and thumbs down. Um, uh, but... Uh, you know, I, I got a general opinion that there was some good and there were some things not as good, not as accurate um, as they should have been. But one of the things, I've seen a lot of religious movies that had depicted Christ. Usually, there'll be this huge crowd of people and it's like Jesus is circled 
Uh, first of all, a lot of times he, in the older movies, he used to glow. He glowed, okay? That he, was, he was brighter and cleaner than anyone else. Now, Palestine is a dirty place. But Jesus would be able to walk through it, sleep on the ground, days at a time, and have an in, in completely pure white robe or garment on. And his hair looked like he just came out of a salon. Everybody else, ratty, curly hair, sweat running down their faces. Not Jesus, because messiahs don't sweat. That's in our mind. So in the movie, they would always depict him as looking more stately, more magnificent, brighter, cleaner, so you'd know who he was. And Isaiah says, you wouldn't know who he was if you saw him in a crowd. There was nothing peculiar about his appearance. There was nothing about his appearance that made him stand out. Because God looks at the heart. John 7, 24, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So we're going to make some judgments by appearance. And sometimes it's not always bad. It isn't always bad, okay? Sometimes there's no ill intent in what we're doing. Uh, we're, just, we're just looking on the surface and we're seeing things and, and we're making some, by our past experience, we're making a judgment. Um, and we're not, we don't have a particular bias, okay? Uh, but other times we can assign someone put someone in a position that they shouldn't be in. How many of us, you know, here's, here's the thing that concerns me today, is not that Zacchaeus wouldn't be welcome in our assembly. Maybe he'd be too welcome. A rich, well-dressed guy coming in. And there might be some people that would say, Wow, he's successful. He's a real catch. Whatever that is. I hope that's not the case. But it concerns me. I went to a church one time. Don and I were talking uh, this week, and I told him, I went to a church raising money to go to Africa. And uh, when I went into the church, uh, I was kind of blown away by the, uh, the, the, the chandeliers and the... Uh, uh, they had a, uh, the, the uh, Lord's table was made out of marble that they explained to me was imported from Italy. And uh, there, it was just very over the top for me. I was kind of, I, I, I kind of looked and said I should have worn a suit, not just a suit, just a sports jacket on a Wednesday night. <laughs> and uh, so I asked one of them about um, the decor. I said, it's... Uh, Pretty fancy. And he goes, well, you understand that we, we live in a very high-class area. And people in this community wouldn't be comfortable if they came in and we didn't have this kind of uh, furniture and chandelier. And, and, and that was his, his answer. And I thought, you know, I, I got his argument, but I also realized that we're appealing to the wrong thing. And what would happen if somebody like me walked in there? How would he feel? Not too comfortable. Not too much like I fit or I belong there. So sometimes this appearance thing can go both ways. Sometimes we, we can end up favoring. As James talks about in the early church, there was a problem of favoring people that were rich. If you were rich and you came into the assembly in some churches in the first century, you'd get an honored seat. If you were poor, you could sit down at their feet. And we don't want to do that either. We don't want to judge by appearance because God looks at the heart. The second thing, well, let me just say this. Who would choose a carpenter to parent the Messiah? Or a Peter or Paul to be an apostle? Would I? No. Or the church to carry the gospel? 
Here's the second thing. Being a critic is the world's easiest job. Um, and it's easy and it's lazy to judge by appearance. It's the easy thing. It's simple. In fact, see, this way, if I do this, when somebody walks in the door or when somebody sits down next to me on the bus or somebody works next to me, I can instantly know them just by, if I just judge by their appearance. I don't have to take the time and the effort to actually get to know them. But it's, it's lazy. It's easy, but it's lazy. It's easy to be a critic. Romans 14 says, Accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinion. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. You know, this is a passage that, that about unity among brethren, and part of the problem was they would, they would judge each other's opinion. What this brother does or what this brother thinks or what this brother believes is not the same as mine. So there's something wrong with him. And we're going to label him. He's got to wear a T-shirt that says, Weaker Brother. And I'll wear one that says, Stronger Brother. And there was a lot of that going on in the church. There was a lot of problems between, ethnic problems between Jews and Gentiles in the early church. And the Jews thought they were superior to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles brought, probably thought they were old fuddy-duddies. That's how we used to call them when I was a kid. Can you imagine that? A Gentile. Oh my goodness, their religion is all about what you can't do. I can see the Gentiles saying that. And the Jews are saying, you know, these people are, are unstable and they're not righteous. They're not doing all the things they're supposed to and not, not doing the things that they're not supposed to. And and Paul says to them, you know what? God can, can make both stand. So, you know, it's easy to look around and to make judgments. It's easy to hear something and not fully understand it and make a judgment. It's easy to judge just by clothes. Or, or just by terminology that someone uses. Romans 14 says, but... Verse 10, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge uh, one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Instead of judging your opinion, I need to understand your opinion and try not to offend you. Try not to hurt you, because you're my brother and you're my sister for whom Christ died. Matthew 7 says, Do not judge that you will not be judged, for in the way you judge... I love this verse because we, we so mistreat it, but I love the truth of it. For in the way you judge, you will be judged, and by the standard of measure, it, that standard of measure will be measured to you. Judge in the way you want to be judged. Let me tell you that if I'm wrong, according to Scripture, I want you to make a judgment about that and set me straight. I do. Because there's nothing more important to me than being right with God. So that's how I'm going to approach you. I'm going to approach you, and if I see you not doing what Jesus says as a Christian, I'm going to point it out, because that's what I want you to do to me. I don't mind being judged by that standard. Now, I want to do that with love, and I want you to do it with love, too. I want us to be understanding of each other and be patient and tolerant and forbearing. But I don't want us to ignore it. I don't want you to ignore it if you see me doing something that could cost me my soul. And I'm not going to ignore it in you, either. Judge righteously. This is the last thing. It's easy to forget why Jesus came. We get so distracted, don't we? You know, even though Jesus goes over to his house and it was great of him to have the hospitality to invite him over to the house, 
Uh, Jesus did not come to teach us to be hospitable. That's not why he came. And good deeds are great. Most of us try to do good deeds whenever we can. We try to respond to our fellow man and be as helpful as we can be in our daily life. But that's not why Jesus came. There's a big fuss right now about a gambling casino down here at the end of the street. And they had a meeting this week about it. And they're concerned. And they're saying, you know, especially people of faith ought to rise up and stop this from coming in. And that's not a bad thing, is it? Not a bad thing to stand against things like that, but it's not why Jesus came. He didn't come to lead a radical agenda. He didn't come to be a revolutionary figure. He didn't come to bring about social change. He didn't come to set a moral standard for society so we could all be better people. He came to seek and save the lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. For when the fullness of time came, he sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. That's why he came. He came to save us. John 3, 17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus did not come to judge the world. His word will judge us in the last day, John 12, 48 to 50, but he came to save us. He came to reach out to us, to, to show us what God is like, to reach out to us, and then to die for our sins. That's why he came. So here are the three lessons. We can try not to judge by appearance. That's what God would want us to do. Try not to judge only by appearance, because that's dangerous. We'll make a lot of misjudgments. We can stop being a critic. And we can try to always remember that Jesus came to save the lost. But maybe the greatest lesson from Zacchaeus is his willingness to change. You know, the thing about these stories, you tell the stories of Zacchaeus and you tell the stories of, of the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8 and, and the lame man in John 5, and you get the idea that Jesus came just to be good to us to do wonderful things to us, and to forgive us. So the woman in John chapter 8 caught in adultery, Jesus said to her, you're forgiven, don't worry about it. Well, that's not in my verse. He said, go and sin no more. And what he says to, what, what happens here with Zacchaeus? What is, the, what is the response we see from Zacchaeus? Don't worry, I'm running home right now. I'm going to fix you a, fix you a fabulous, fabulous dinner. Now, he says, if I've done anything wrong, I, I, will, I will pay back four times what I did. And I'll give half of my money to the poor. His willingness to change is what characterizes Zacchaeus. Acts 2.38, Peter said to the people on the day of Pentecost, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And in chapter 22, Paul looks back at his conversion, and Ananias said to him, And now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So there's a change that takes place. And that change is what's so significant, what's so important. The heart. God can see the heart. God can see the people that are willing to change. We can only see appearances. And they could be poor, they could be young, they could be old, they could be rich, they could be sick, they could be healthy, they could be physically fit, like Don and I, or they could be, uh, you know, they could be, uh, have let themselves go. But God doesn't see that. God sees the heart and their willingness to change and come to Him. So what does God see when He looks at you? you know, I'm looking out here and I can take a snapshot of each person and, and, my, and visually I get an impression. But God has taken a snapshot of your heart. What impression does He get? 
if you're already a Christian, I hope he sees a person who is totally and completely committed to him as Lord and Savior. And that that's demonstrated in your daily life and people see that by your actions. If you're not a child of God, if you haven't come to Jesus and he's looking at your heart, does he see a, a humble, willing, seeking person who wants to respond to him? Or does he see somebody who's like Zacchaeus, like, like the people saw Zacchaeus? Someone who's prosperous, successful, but unwilling to change. You'll have to answer the question. Let's stand and sing.